uh, let me introduce exercise, right? <coughs> okay, what I want you to do is in your class, respective classes, groups of three. I said groups of three, please make a note, right? Okay. Think of the six units that we covered, okay, collectively. And then starting from the first, first unit or second unit, whatever, right? But I'm writing for convenience, I'm writing starting from unit one. Uh, list two to three questions that your group can think of that may potentially come in the final exam. Okay. Starting from here, that means what? So by end of by end of uh, the exercise, you should be having at least twelve, right? All questions total. Okay. At least meaning that's not enough, right? If you get three questions, let's say, at least three questions, then it'll be 18, right, out of six. So, so you should get a total of 12 questions and above, okay? <laughs> Put them in the chat. Okay. As you come up with questions, in the chat for now. Okay. Later, all these questions would be posted in the community. Okay, so everyone understands the exercise. And if you think there's a brainstorming, right? So, um, brainstorming starts now, and uh, you should, instructors, you can turn on the videos in your class so that way I can take a look at them while they're doing it, uh, 15 minutes, okay? So it's a, it's a speed, uh, what do you call it as like speed brainstorming, right? So about two to three minutes per module, right? Whatever comes to mind, module one, module two, module three, four, five, six, like that, right? Two to three questions per module. And then post, Give them to your facilitator there, and they can type it in the chat as you're doing it. So facilitator, you can go around, collect the questions. What students can do is on each sheet of paper, they can write unit two units per paper, give them to you, and then you post them in the chat. Okay? Your time begins now. Turn on your video so that I can now.
right? We would perhaps have about 100 questions there in the chat. And then that is the review for the, uh, for the finals. Okay, we didn't achieve that, but whatever little is there, I'm not motivated to post them in the community. If somebody wants to copy paste that in the, from the chat and post to in the community, please do so. Now, considering uh, this experience, I'll just show you uh, two, two slide, slide decks that I have here, uh, which I prepared last time we taught this class. Over a period of a couple of lectures, we actually reviewed all the material using these two slide decks. But here, I would not use that much time. I will show you what I have. I will give a high-level overview what these things have. And then I will leave it up to you to, and then I'll post it in a minute. Okay? And then I'll wrap up the class. Okay? If I got... 50 questions there from all the colleges, I would have gone even beyond 12 a.m. Definitely not, right? I got great questions from PVP and JNTV only, only two colleges, okay? But I'll do my duty. I will show what, what I have in terms of review. And it's up to you whether you will review those things uh, in preparation for your exam or not, okay? Having said that, first we'll review The first three chapters, this one slide deck has first three chapters. Okay. So we started off with counting instructions, right? And that was a precursor to introducing complex T analysis, right? So we made the students count, and then we said, when you apply the filter of dropping all the factors, not the variable, but all the constants and all the factors, and we only keep the largest growing term. That is what is called the asymptotic behavior. Okay. Uh, if you correlate it back to the questions posted there in the chat, this was actually one of the questions. Somebody said, explain what asymptotic behavior is. Okay. That is a correlation. Okay. And then we covered about how we determine quickly, given a piece of code, what is the order of the complexity, right? Depending on the for loops, we, we said that if there are no loops, then the order of execution is really one, function of n equal to one, okay? If you have one loop, which goes from one to n, we say fn equal to n. If you have two nested loops, which go each from one to n, then it becomes order of n squared, and so on. If I spend a lot of time reviewing, uh, and then typically I would stop here and ask you to do it for a second, and then the notation, right? The theta notation, the O notation, and the omega notation. Okay. So the theta notation is used when you can figure out the exact Fn, okay? Then we still use the theta notation. Okay, like counting instructions and all of those things. That was a theta notation, okay? But when you have large pieces of code, it's very hard to count instructions to come up with the complexity. That's why we refer to what is known as the big O notation, okay? Where we arrive at a big O approximate analysis, okay? And then what the big O gives us, it gives you some kind of an upper bound. Okay, that means the program can be no worse than that. That is what the big O notation gives. Okay. And then we considered some examples, right? Like sorting an array. And then we basically, typically we count, uh, we saw the loops, and then based on that, we came up with the order of n squared in this case. And then we did some analysis between order, order of big O versus theta, right? So we said that one can be a subset of others, but not the other way around, right? So 
the theta n squared is always equal to order of n squared, but not the other way around. The equation doesn't work the other way around. <laughs> so we did a true false example, right? The theta n algorithm is order of n. Actually, I asked students to write down true and false. We did this exercise also. Okay. All you have to do is go back, students, and then you do that exercise again. Now, here are some notes on big O and the theta, right? So we said big O gives upper bound, whereas the theta gives the actual bound. So the actual bound is also called tight bound, okay? Now, when we, when we cannot find a tight bound, we, we use the lower case O, okay? Uh, to show it as opposed to big O, we use the lower case O. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, that's what and then we did some examples between theta n versus o n okay okay and then I said what are the tight bounds here legitimate question right pretty much every slide here is a legitimate question by the way and as I said here it's much easier to find the o complexity other than the theta complexity then we introduced the Omega notation. What is omega notation? Is the opposite of the big O notation, right? This basically tells us you can't do any better than what we come up with. That means it is basically the, the between these two, you are able to come up with the lower bound and the upper bound in terms of the program performance. Okay? As highlighted in blue here, theta gives the lower bound for the complex. Okay? <laughs> now, if we cannot come up with a high bound, we use the smaller. Notation here. Okay. And then there's an example that we did. Same example I copied here. You just need to go back and come up, write those answers there. Okay. And the answers are right there for you. So when you review, you can look at the solutions to after you did your exercise. Compare notes. That's how you learn, right? So after Bottom line is when we have all these notations, the one that we mostly use is the big O notation. Okay? Because the worst case analysis, even in business, right, we always have to deal with what is the worst that can happen, whether it is business or real life. Even in the war, right? Before you go to war, you say, what is the worst that can happen? We really don't care about the best, right? So that's the reason why worst case analysis of the big notation is important. Somebody posted a question on recursive, uh, some recursive complexity question in the chat. Forget who it was. <coughs> so when you have a recursion, how do you come up with the complexity of that? So what is the theta n for this code and what is the order of n, right? Again, I'm not answering here, I want you to the answers are already there from our class, okay? So if you review this one, right? Because this is a, anything to do with factorials and Fibonacci numbers, you should review them because those are the easy examples that we cover in the class and those are the type of questions that would come in the exam. Okay. Same thing here is some binary search we did and then we use the binary search example to lay the foundation for the logarithmic search. Remember when we said when we do the T traversal or or even a simple binary search, right? It doesn't have to be T traversal, it can be anything. I can do a binary search on a socket array, right? It turns out it, it, it's, a, it's a log, right? Uh, it's a log factor as opposed to, uh, like if it's a tree, it is log two, right? Depth, depth of the tree kind of a thing. So it's always of the order of log n. That's what we introduced. Okay. Now in the chat, um, you put some questions related to um, binary search and quick sort. I think somebody put something on quick sort if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And we laid the foundation as to why we need these sorting techniques, right? Uh, when things are sorted, it's much easier to do a quick search on what we are looking for, okay? 
because every time you you do the search, repeat the search thing, you are eliminating one half of the list because you're dividing it into half, comparing the value to what you're looking for. Depending on whether the value is equal or less than or greater than, you go to the, you eliminate one half of the tree and focus on the other half. Tree or the data set. When I say tree, I mean, I'll mean the data set. Okay. So when you do the binary search, we said that, look, when you started off in this case of phone book 3,000 pages, every single time you are eliminating half of it. So, so in solid iterations, you come to one page. Okay, that is the beauty of binary stuff. So repeatedly halving the size of the search space. Okay, that is the basic idea behind a binary search. Great example question, right? I could reword it and say, hey, what is the main idea behind binary search? Okay. The main idea is every time you go through the loop or iteration, you're Halving the size of the search space. That is a key idea. Okay. So when you do these things, you can basically locate the item in log two in comparison because you keep come eliminating half of it. So this one here shows you how you come up with half of it, right? But log is in the complexity. So if you read this, review this slide, you will know how we come up with the log n. Then let me show you. So, <laughs> so here is an example where visually we we show you how the binary search works. Right? Again, great exam question. Right? They can always say, give an example. Remember, some of most of your questions are explain something with an example. Right? This is one of those things. Right? Uh, the last one that was put by PVP Siddhartha so explain P and P and P R and P complete with example. Here I'm saying explain binary search through an example. So here is a visualization. So if you review this thing, you should be able to answer that question easily. Okay. And explain. Now code, right? I do not know. None of the examples here really ask for you to write code. That's one thing that I have noticed, at least today, over a site. Okay, so uh, here is some code. You can review that. Okay. Now, what is the condition for doing a binary search? It has to be sorted, right? Otherwise, you cannot do that. Now, then the next question is, how do you sort? There are many sorting algorithms, right? Bubble sort, selection sort, and all of those things. But we covered a couple of important sorts. One was the merge sort, and the other one was the quick sort, if you remember, right? So here I think, uh, I don't know if somebody asked the question in the chat or not. I don't remember. Okay. So how does the merge sort work? Again, right? Good, nice animation here how the merge sort works, right? What are we doing? At every stage, you're dividing the array into two to begin with, right? That's why if you look at the first array that was given, we need to sort that array. What did we do? We divided it into two, okay? Then you divide that again into two. So you continue to divide like that, again into two, okay? Now you divide that again. So what are we left with? Individual items. Now, when you compare those individual items, you sort them. So H and D are compared, you swap. M and G are compared, you swap. B and K are compared, there is no swap there because B is already so, uh, comes before K. A and Q, same thing. F and L, B and P are swap. P and D are swapped, R and C are swapped, and J, J and N are in good, good position. Now you take the left two, E, H, G, M, right? Sort those, okay? So you're first breaking it down, going down, and then you're merging them together. That's why it's called merge, all right? In the process of merging, you're sorting the elements. Again, visual elements, right? So a legitimate question. I would not ask you to write 
a merge sort algorithm, instead I would ask you to explain merge sort, show a visual representation. So here I took a big chunk of items, a long one here, right? But you could take half the size of that to explain the merge sort graphically like this. If you put this graphical representation like this, you'll get your full point. For those of you who want to, I, mean, I won't ask to write an algorithm in an exam, uh, typically, and this is a very small one. Uh, I would give the algorithm and ask them to trace it. Okay. So I show you the example there, how it goes through uh, each iteration. As you trace the code, you will see how the pointers go. So this is tracing. That's all we are doing here. Okay, review that. Some piece of code there. I will not cover code in the review class, so you can convince yourself. Then we have quick sort. What is the premise behind quick sort? You select a pivot, right? And then anything less than the pivot goes in one array, and anything greater than the pivot goes to the right array. And then again, you select the pivot, right? Recursively. That's what quick sort is. Okay. And then it explains, right? Pick a random element and partition that into anything less than that element x, it goes left array. Anything greater than that goes to the right array. Okay, g. g is greater, right? And then again, you recursively sort left array and right array. After you do all of those things, you join L, E, and G. Similar to merge sort, you should be able to show how it works. So I gave a pictorial representation as to how quick sort works uh, using the basic logic. Okay. These are very legitimate questions here, by the way. At least here in Berkeley, where I teach, and uh, other places where I teach here. Okay. Here is a visual representation. Running time. Okay. And then I gave you one website address where you can look up all the uh, times, right, complexities of these algorithms. Okay, I think that slide is still here, yeah. Big cheat, big old cheat sheet. If you go there, you can see all the time complexities of these in case you need to memorize any of this stuff. Okay, let me pause here. Questions, comments? You're all silent. Any questions? Put them in the chat. <laughs> when we talk about greedy, that's when we introduce a map size. And then we introduce the concept of spanning trees. Okay. If I remember vaguely, this is where we also did the Kruskal algorithm and Prince algorithm, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And then we also did the single source shortest path problem, the famous Dijkstra algorithm to solve that. So what is greedy method? Somebody posted a question related to that, right? So you should be able to use this, what I wrote in the slide here, right? You, you have to first say what the supposition is. You say a problem is solved by sequence of decisions. So in each sequence, the, first, the decision you make is based on greedy. What it means you are looking for locally optimal solution, okay? Now, if you're talking about locally optimal solution, then you should, and, and the question asks for a given example, okay? So you should be able to give an example. This, I, the, we can forget that, here is a good example for that, okay? Here is a greedy, greedy algorithm that works perfectly, okay? So if you make a locally optimal choice, going from vertex zero to vertex one, locally optimal is taking part one, correct? The other parts are five and six, so you take one. To go from V1 to V2, you take the lowest again, that is two. And from V2 to V4, okay? Greedy works perfectly here, okay? Now, if your question is, show us an example where Greedy does not work. There you go, staged. All you have to do is, hey, let me draw a multi-stage graph, then I can demonstrate that greedy does not work. 
you can see if I do locally optimal from V0, I have to take one. So one goes to stage one, uh, row two, right? That is V12. From there, if I take VD, right? So what do I take the lowest path again from there, right? So the lowest path looks like five, okay? So like that, if you do, if you see greedy method gives you 23 as the answer, whereas the actual solution, optimal solution gives you seven. So greedy doesn't work for multi-stage batch. Okay. Uh, if you, if, if the question says, tell me where greedy doesn't work, give an example or give a, give a scenario where it doesn't work, then you can say greedy does not work in a multi-stage graph. But then the instructor is not right. When they say, not only scenario, show an example. If they say show an example, then you should be able to draw a picture like this. Okay? You have different nodes in stage one and stage two. Okay? If you can draw a node like this, then you should be able to say greasy doesn't work here. Greasy doesn't work for knapsack problem too, right? We already discussed that. Okay? Then, we introduce the concept of spanning trees. What is a spanning tree? It is nothing but an undirected, connected, undirected graph. Since it's a tree, it has no cycles, and it is a spanning tree as long as it covers all the nodes in the graph. Okay. Now, when you draw the spanning tree, then any spanning tree with the smallest total weight becomes the minimum spanning tree. So any graph can have many spanning trees. The trick is to find the minimum spanning tree. Uh, we did examples in class exercises to do spanning tree, right? These are two. We know what a spanning tree is. The next question is how do you come up with a spanning tree? Okay. In a tree, there are only two things, right? One is you have vertex and the other one is edge, right? So whatever way you come up with, then those two things are related, right? You can either make it vertex-centric or edge-centric, okay? So if you go to the, <coughs> gave, I gave you some edge-centric example, and of course, vertex-centric we did too, right? Um, then we have this concept of a cycle property, right? Uh, we define what a cycle is, okay? Now, when you have a cycle, right, that edge which makes it a cycle typically would not be the minimum spanning tree because minimum spanning tree is covering the nodes, right? The cycle would not be there, okay? Okay. Any questions, comments? Um, how to compute the spanning tree, okay? And I gave the answers there, okay? How to come up with a minimum cost spanning tree. And then there are two algorithms to find minimum spanning tree, that's what we said. One is called the Kruskal algorithm, the other one is called the Prim algorithm, right? So these are the steps of Kruskal. Kruskal, what they do is, <laughs> They take all the nodes of the tree as a forest to begin with. That means on the top, they put all the nodes. If it has N nodes, they'll put N nodes, not connected. Then they start connecting those nodes by, taking, by looking at the set of edges, which are already in sorted order, okay? And they keep adding the smallest weight edge to the forest, as long as it does not cause a cycle. And we know from theorem and also considering the discussion that we had, uh, an N node graph would have an N minus one edges, right? So that's why we say stop if there are N minus one edges. So I gave an example that we discussed, Kruskal. The reason why I show examples in my review slide deck is most of the exam questions tend to be show an example, show an example. So if you can see some examples like this, you'll be able to answer that. Okay. Convince yourself what this example, how this 
example correlates to these three steps. Okay. Because you need to sort the edges in a non decreasing order. And then you start off with the forest. If you see here, you can move the chat window. The forest means it covers all the nodes, right? It has one through six, it covered. Now you chose one, two. Okay. <clears throat> the edge with the minimum weight, right? One, two is the minimum weight, and it's a non uh, non decreasing order. So that means the weight, the cost is increasing. So you connect one, two. Okay. And then you proceed like that based on the steps listed. Kruskal versus Prim, right? What is the main difference? One one focuses on the, it starts with the forest, if you see the second bullet, right? And then you start building the edges, okay? And you're always looking for the globally smallest edge that does not cause a cycle, okay? So as you build the edges, the trees in the forest are getting con connected. That is the essence of the um, the Kruskal algorithm, whereas in the prim, you start with one node, okay? Because your goal is to always have a connected component, meaning a connected tree. You don't start with the forest, you start with one node, okay? And then you look at all the edges from that node and find the smallest among them, okay? You then add the neighboring vertex to that. Okay, now you continue that one till you reach n minus one steps. Okay, now where do you use Kruskal, where do you use Prim? Okay, if the graph is very much dense, meaning it has a lot of edges, okay, um, then, <coughs> then Prim's algorithm has been shown to run faster. Those are called dense graphs. They are more edges than vertices. There is opposite of that, meaning you have less edges than vertices. Okay, that's right, the sparse graph. We use Kruskal algorithm. Then we covered knapsack, right? We covered knapsack in so many different contexts. So you should be able to explain what a knapsack problem is. I would not, you know that, I, will, I don't have to repeat. Okay. The idea is to fill the knapsack with the maximum benefit, right? It's not about filling it to the maximum weight. It's really about the benefit of the gap. Okay. Then we covered the single source shortest path problem. So this is where we talked about uh, coming up with uh, all pairs shortest path, right? And we said we can make use of the table to come up with a single source shortest path using, for example, something like a Dijkstra algorithm, right? That is what we did here. Okay. And then here is an example that we considered for that. Okay. There are many variations of shortest path. Uh, we didn't cover most of these things, but I listed them for completeness sake here. Right, there are different combinations, right? Permutations and combinations of shortest path. Okay, single source, single destination, single source, all destination. That means you are uh, you are con seeing the shortest or the shortest path for all the other destination from one particular source. Okay, and so on. Okay, and we covered some some properties, right? Subpaths of shortest paths are also shortest path themselves. Right? No cycle. Okay, we covered some of these things. I don't think these questions should be asked. I just put them there. And then, if you recall, we made I mean, I made you do the Dijkstra apply the Dijkstra algorithm and trace it. Okay, that's what I have done. Okay, let me close that. Okay, same thing. What is if somebody post a question there? Right in the chat, explain to the differences between greedy versus dynamic programming. Here is a slide for that. See, questions don't come out of the blue, okay? They are all really there as part of the content, right? 
the reason why I need you to do the brainstorming is, right, this is your opportunity to think. When you are able to think and brainstorm questions collectively, then all of a sudden you would have covered the entire subject material, right? And if you don't know the answer, a group member might know it. So in the process of discussing, I mean, it's a well-known educational theory, by the way. You learn by discussing. The more you discuss amongst, of course, if the people are discussing, uh, both of them are bad, then the discussion won't be fruitful. Okay? But obviously, students are bright. So in general, collective discussion helps. Okay, so I gave uh, like that summary slide for, for these four to six chapters. Um, principle of optimality that we covered, if you remember. I, like, I love this principle of optimality, right? So when you're talking about dynamic programming, right? So if you are able to maintain <coughs> the principle of optimality, right? You can, this is a very good question, right? What is one of the key conditions for doing dynamic programming? The key conditions, principle of optimality, meaning the sub-solutions are themselves uh, optimal, right? Um, so going from top down, okay? So that's where the principle of optimality comes, okay? Uh, here is an example that I show you where the principle of optimality doesn't apply, right? If you look at the 13, uh, if you look at uh, the 13 cents problem, you have to choose the right sub-solutions, right? The right sub-solutions are six cents and seven cents here because you get five coins. If, sorry, that, that's the wrong solution. If you, because six, for six cents, that is optimal solution, five and one, right? For seven cents, five and one is the optimal solution. Now, by combining two optimal solutions like that, can you come up with optimal solutions for 13 cent problem? No. The example shows here, hey, there's another better solution that is 11 cent and two cent. Okay. You get four coins. Okay. So we, we took this example to explain the principle of optimality. Okay. So why am I hitting that one? I should be in presentation mode. Okay. So I give some examples here. Yes. See, if the sub-solutions of an optimal solution of the problem are themselves optimal solutions for the sub-problem. Okay? That is the definition. Okay. <coughs> so if you take 11 cents and 2 cents, it will give you the uh, optimal solution for 13 cents. Okay? Now I said, okay, does the shortest path problem satisfy the principle of optimality? You can put an answer there if you want to. It does. If I remember it, we did some kind of theory there, right? If you take the shortest path from A to C, uh, any other paths in between also by themselves would be shortest path. If they are not, we, we use proof by contradiction. And we said that if they are not, then it cannot be the shortest path. So hence, it's going to be shortest path. That's how we proved it. Okay? And we, I gave you an example of a double loop in longest path problem showing that that does not satisfy the principle of optimality. I mean, I don't expect questions like, hey, uh, like the longest path. Shortest path, I can understand. People do remember that. The longest path problem is hard to remember especially in exam time, you know? Then we talked about matrix multiplication, right? So we took uh, different matrices, and why did we can talk at length on matrix multiplication? Because it's all about performance, right? The order in which this matrix multiplication is performed, depending on how you choose the order, the number of multiplications can be optimized, okay? Meaning, in essence, what we say is, in which order these things should be multiplied, so it would take the minimum number of computations to arrive at the product, okay? Remember the famous PQR that we talked about? So we make use of the PQR, right? To look at the, <coughs> to look at the total cost, okay? So you have to review that carefully. So I gave you the 
example matrices here, right? Do you want to multiply A1, A2 first, followed by A3? Or do you want to do A1? Before you do A1, you want to do A2, A3 first, and then multiply with A1, okay? Two different paths, right? I can give an exact example like that. A1, 3 by 5, A2, 5 by 8, and A3, 8 by 2. And then I can ask you the question. Okay, without giving you the total values. I'll say, which is better, A1, A2, then A3, or A2, A3, then you do it with A1. Okay, if you remember PQR, those are the dimensions. Uh, it's very easy for you to calculate how many multiplications would happen in each of those combinations. So then we talked about OBST, right? Where basically the way you organize a tree is, right? And the tree cost itself is minimum, meaning when you're traversing the tree, the cost is minimum, okay? And then <coughs> where, where we said we'll use this optimal binary tree, we said that if we know the frequency of the search for individual keys. So if I know that I'm looking for A a lot of times, in my keyword searches, where do I want to put A closest to the root, right? Because you know that most of the time that is, that is going to be used, so you put it closer, it's easy to fetch faster, okay? We said we use this uh, OBST in databases and things like that, right? We mentioned that too. And we also determined that OBST is used in situations where you do only a few insertions because insertion into a tree after the main tree is completed is a very expensive operation. So you use it where you do not have to change the tree often. Okay. So I give some examples. And then there's an exercise that we did. I, I, recre I just copy pasted that here. Uh, so that way, in terms of preparing for the exam, you can redo the exercise and be prepared, okay? I gave the solutions also there for you, for both greedy and uh, dynamic programming, okay? Okay, that was that. And then, of course, we covered knapsack, right? So different way of doing it. Knapsack, you can do brute force, you can do dynamic programming, and then, of course, how you do the subproblem definition in dynamic programming, we discussed that. Okay. Knapsack, right? In the question check, I don't remember. But we gave the equation there. It's hard to remember algorithms, right? So I do not encourage faculty members to give questions where students have to memorize anything, right? The question should be testing their understanding as opposed to testing whether they have memorized stuff, right? So instead of asking them to write a complicated algorithm, I would much rather give them the algorithm and ask them say, what does this algorithm do? Explain with some test data. That is a legitimate question, okay? I think I'll stop here. It's all there. Um, anyway, if you have any questions, pose them in the community until your um, until until your exam day, and I'll be happy to answer them in the community. Slides, because there's not much interaction. So, but you guys, of the many colleges you both did phenomenal. So you should be able to understand this anyway. Okay, I'll go to the last slide because I, I always end my lectures with this one particular quote. I don't know if you came across this quote. I love this quote. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Okay? And hopefully that single step is taken in the right direction. So that's all, folks. I have nothing much to say. Good luck to all of you.
and enjoy uh, your rest of the semesters, and hopefully most of you will graduate. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them, or I will sign off.